Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the British Land Company PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so and these will be available via your Investor Meet company dashboard. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll and if you could give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I would now like to hand you over to the Executive Management Team from British Land Company PLC, uh, Bavesh. Good morning, sir. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. Um, very pleased to be here. Um, I thought we, uh, we presented our half-year results on Monday this week, and I thought it perhaps it would be helpful just to provide a bit of color um, on some of the key messages that we talked about. Um, and then very happy to take some, some questions uh, from you guys afterwards. So we reported results for the six months to the end of September the 30th. Um, and a uh, couple of key headlines I'd want to draw out. Firstly, um, really pleased with the operational performance that we've seen in the business in the first half uh, of, of this year. We've leased really well across the business. We leased 1.6 million square feet of space, and we did that at 12% ahead of um, value or market rents, so what we call ERV. Uh, we control our costs very well, uh, and so good sort of top-line growth in terms of leasing and rental growth. And good cost control meant where our underlying profit was up 3.4% uh, in the period. Now, as you know, the macroeconomic and geopolitical backdrop remains uncertain. Interest rates have increased since we last reported. So as a result of that, we saw an outward yield shift of 23 basis points, albeit that did slow down in the period, meaning we had a 2.5% fall in the value of our portfolio. Importantly, though, we saw really good rental growth, uh, and rental growth has accelerated. Um, uh, ERV has been up more than 3% across all of our three markets, or three sub-markets, which I'll talk about in a second. And this has helped cushion the impact of the portfolio value decline. In the near-term movements in market interest rates, both up and down, will continue to affect property values. But rental growth is the, likely to be the dominant driver of medium-term performance in our business. Um, and we feel and have guided that we are expecting our rental growth to be at the top of our, end of our guidance for each of our sub-markets. So last year, we had set rental guidance of 2 to 4% for campuses, 3 to 5% for our retail parks, and 4 to 5% for London Urban Logistics. Um, and six months in, we feel we'll be guiding or are guiding towards the top end of those ranges. We look at something called net equivalent yield. So what's the income we get today on our portfolio? What is the income we'd get as leases regear? Um, uh, re uh, and what's the sort of weighted average of that? And that's a 6.1% uh, net equivalent yield. That compares to a five-year swap rate of just over 4.1%. And we look at five-year swap rate because that's the, the duration of which we typically borrow. So when you look at that spread, we think that's, an attractive sort of headroom between what our portfolio is generating versus what market sort of uh, borrowing rates are. So that, as well as our development upside across our portfolio, which I'll talk about in a second, we think provides for really attractive uh, future returns uh, in, in our business. So let me touch a little bit now on um, each of the component parts of our business. Um, one of the things we talked about to uh, to the market this week was in the right sub-markets, we're seeing bifurcation. We're seeing that accelerating, whether it's across our campuses, our retail parks, or in, in London urban logistics. The best parts of London are thriving. So if I take Broadgate, for example, which is one of our campuses, maybe I'll take a step back. We've got um, uh, our campus, our, our London office portfolio is, is very much focused on, on London. We've got a campus in Paddington in West uh, London. We've got a campus in Regent's Place, which is just outside of King's Cross in the sort of in the Knowledge Quarter. Uh, we've got Broadgate in the city, which just sits above Liverpool Street. And then a new campus we're developing a mixed use scheme is Canada Water, which is on the Rotherhithe Peninsula. Um, so if I talk uh, uh, for Broadgate as an example of what we're seeing, uh, it's in the Northeast 
corner of the city of London, but the performance is very different than we're seeing in the rest of the city. Rents are up nearly 4% in the last six months. Our vacancy is 3%. That compares to 11.5% for the city as a whole. Uh, and we're seeing really good rental growth. So 3.7% market rent growth against uh, sub 1% for the rest of the city. We see a similar performance uh, a picture in our retail parks. So our retail parks are full. We have 99% occupancy. We've carried that since last year. We were full. Um, and that compares to a vacancy rate of close to 14% when you look at UK retail and aggregates. Um, and the parks are performing really well. There are net store openings on parks, um, meaning there's more things opening than closing, as opposed to shopping centers in the high street where you're seeing net closures. Um, and I'll talk more about retail parks in, in, in a second. And then the third element of our business is London Urban Logistics. So this is inner London development-led last mile logistics that we are building. And again, we, we, we think it's a really attractive part of the market where vacancy levels are really low, 0.4%. That compares to sub 7% for UK big box. Um, there just isn't any really high quality or um, last mile logistics space in London. And we're taking our skill sets and developing and planning and being able to create space uh, in offices and deploying that into logistics space in London. Again, I'll talk about that more uh, in a second. Um, but since we've launched our, our strategy in 2021 under Simon Carter, our CEO, you know, we have transformed our portfolio. Nearly 90% of our business now is focused on those sub markets that are performing really well, um, whether it's campuses, retail parks, and, uh, and London urban logistics. So let me touch on each of these component parts of our, our business. Um, what we are really seeing on the ground is quality is in really, really in demand. And you can see this in terms of take up of new buildings. So this page is showing you what is the level of take up and what kind of rents that we're getting. Um, take up for new buildings is 71% of all of the space that's being taken up in the marketplace, so a very high proportion. Um, and when you when you look at sort of the segmentation of the market, we're really seeing a three three tier market. So Cushman and Wakefield, one of uh, one of our advisors, has started to talk about super prime, prime, and secondary. And super prime is the top ten percent of prime buildings. And what do we mean by prime? Those are buildings that have proximity to major transport hubs. They have access to good cafes and bars. There's good amenity really gets sustainability credentials uh, of the building and then the overall quality of, of the building. Increasingly an important criteria that occupiers look for when choosing where they want to, to um, take their space. And you can see on the right hand side that rents and premiums for these buildings have grown significantly and are expected to continue to grow at a much faster rate than prime. Uh, and that was evident what I showed you on the previous page in terms of um, performance of Broadgate. So for the best quality space, the demand is there, occupiers are willing to pay the rent um, uh, and, and, and take the space. As I said, um, we've had really good operational momentum across all three of our campuses. So if I touch on what we've delivered over the half, we had deals on over 368,000 square feet. That's at seven and a half percent ahead of market rents. Um, and we've seen a real uptick in demand in the period. We have another 281,000 square feet under offer. Uh, that's 9.7% ahead of market rents. And then in terms of negotiations, a good lead indicator we look at is how many uh, square feet of space are we negotiating with potential occupiers versus the amount of space that we have. And we've got nearly 1.8 million square feet of negotiations underway on 1 million square feet uh, of space. We also have a, a, a flexible uh, offer, which we call Story, which represents about 5% of our business. And there we've had 71,000 square feet of leasing in the period, and we have occupancy at about 87%. So Story is a really sort of a well-evolved, high-quality flex offer that we provide. We've been running it for about six years, uh, and we continue to see strong levels of interest in that part of the business. Um, uh, and we look at opportunities for it to, to um, uh, expand across our portfolio. And so these, this delivery in the first half demonstrates, you know, continued demand for best-in-class workspace. 
And for us, it's our campus proposition that really think we think stands out. Um, occupiers place huge importance on getting the best space. They want accessible location. They want high quality amenity and environment, and particularly in a world post COVID where everybody is reevaluating what space they want. They want less space, but they want better space. They're not very price sensitive, but it's important that all of the, the, the proposition that we offer on the campuses is, is there when they're selecting because they're making a decision for the next 10, potentially 15 years. They need to get it right. Uh, and they need to ensure it meets the needs of what their, um, uh, uh, their, uh, their, their employees are asking for. And the campus model plays to that uh, as evidenced in, in the strong leasing numbers. We also have high occupancy across our campuses, right? Um, at Broadgate, we've successfully relet or under offer on nearly 300,000 square feet of space. And occupancy is now at 97%. At Paddington, uh, we're full. We have 100% occupancy. One of our most exciting developments there is 3 Sheldon Square. It will be an all-electric building. Uh, we've already pre-let 65% of that to Virgin Media O2. Uh, and we have another 27,000 square feet under offer, which will take us to 86% pre-let before the building completes. And the building's about four months away from completion. So another good lead indicator say, you know, for the best space, people are willing to take it um, even before, before, before the space completes. And then at Regent's Place, which is in the heart of the Knowledge Quarter in London, we are looking to reposition that campus as London's premier science campus. So occupancy there is 88%. That's a function of us deliberately taking back space so that we can reposition it for innovation and life sciences. Uh, and the reason we want to do that, we think that's a key growth part of the UK economy where we'll be able to attract occupiers who are willing to pay a higher rent and higher um, uh, growth in rent. So if I touch on the innovation and life sciences a little bit more in detail, um, and Regent's Place really is key part of our push towards innovation and science-based um, uh, repositioning. Um, and worth maybe reminding you of a, of a couple of points. Firstly, life science is not just about labs. Um, as important as labs are, these companies also need headquarter space. Uh, life sciences is just one of the key innovation areas that we are targeting. We're looking at data science, at technology, looking at physical sciences, clean energy, uh, AI, fintech. So there's a large universe of companies with huge growth potential um, that want really high quality space, and there's not enough of it available today. Secondly, um, it's really important uh, to be in the knowledge quarter. And that's where our Regents Place campus is located. It's in the heart of the Knowledge Quarter. We're surrounded by organizations like UCL, UCLH, the Turing Institute, the Wellcome Trust, the Francis Crick Institute, um, all places of research, academia. Um, and it's why the, the Knowledge Quarter is widely recognized as the natural place in London for businesses in this sector that want to cluster. And businesses do want to cluster together. Um, want to share, to collaborate, to attract talent. Um, and, and so we're fortunate that Regions Place is located where it is um, in the heart of that knowledge quarter. We're working hard to build our relationships with those institutions. We signed a memorandum of understanding recently with UCL. Um, and that was really for us to, to sort of plug in and build on the wider ecosystem in and around Regions Place. What does that MOU mean? It means that we can leverage UCL's globally recognized brand and network. It allows our occupiers at Reasons Place to access the technical services and facilities that UCL can provide. And it means we're in partnership with an organization that's very effective at sort of um, embedding in the nursery ground for that next generation of occupiers. Um, as an example, for example, uh, you, you will, many of you will recognize, recognize DeepMind um, and that is an institution that came out of or was born in UCL. And we're starting to see early signs of benefit. Um, we've got space under offer to a UCL spin out already um, and have really good conversations um, on lab conversion space of uh, potential occupiers. Um, outside of London, we're up, so we're looking it, uh, beyond Regents Place, there's other pockets in the Golden Triangle that we think um, are really play to this this sort of demand for high quality innovation in life science space. 
Um, outside of London, we recently signed uh, a prelet at the Priestley Center in Guildford. Uh, so this is one of the largest life science deals in the UK this year. Uh, we prelet uh, the space to a company called LGC. So it's a global life sciences tool company. They took 48,000 square feet of lab and office space um, at a premium to rents that you would pay for traditional office space in the area. And that means this business is over 60% pre-let. And it's pre-let ahead of practical completion, which will be in Q1 of 2024. And then in Cambridge, uh, we have been deploying capital. We bought the ARM headquarters about a year and a half ago. We then subsequently bought the patch of land beside that, the Peterhouse expansion. And we've committed to build that this year. So that'll be 96,000 square feet of space. Construction started in uh, just recently in Q3. Uh, and we will be targeting PC in Q1 2025. And it will be the only new office and lab building that will be delivered in Cambridge in 2025. Uh, and because of that, we're already having strong interest from a range of different suppliers. So I really think pivoting up uh, elements of our campus to innovation and life sciences build building allows us to focus on those parts of the UK economy that we think will be growing and will play high and growing rents. Let me now turn to retail parks. Um, we feel the retail parks are the preferred format for many retailers. And the reason we feel that way is the space is very affordable. Rents have reduced over time. Business rates have rebased. Service charges have always been low. Uh, and sales are now well above pre-pandemic levels. And so we look at a metric called occupancy cost ratio, which is rent rates and service charges a proportion of sales. And that now at our parks is 9%. That's down from nearly 18% in 2016. And it's much lower than in shopping centers, which are around 13 to 14%. So if you think about retailers, you know, all run on very thin margins. The affordability of the format is very important to them. Uh, and retail parks provide that. Second bit is parks are an ideal format for a broad range of occupiers. They are located on major arterial roads. They provide ample free car parking. They're simple in concept. They're large steel boxes that can be easily adapted. And because of that, we're seeing a lot of incremental demand coming from a broad range of occupiers. That can be discounters, the Poundlands, the B&Ms, essential retail, and then multi-channel specialists. That could be the grocers. It could be some of the uh, UK um, fashion retailers next. M&S are two big occupiers that are uh, with us on our parks. Um, and so affordable, really a good format for omni-channel retailers. We attract a broad range of occupiers. So the demand is coming in. And you counter that from a supply perspective um, planning regimes are quite restricted, meaning there's very little or no new supply coming in. So the value of a parks per square foot today is lower than the value to develop a park per square foot. So it's uneconomic to build new supply. And so you've got really strong demand and limited supply really plays into um, uh, what we're seeing on the ground. Um, and we, as I said, we're 99% full across our parks. Um, and when you take that sort of supply demand dimension together, it's why you're seeing net openings since 2016, more units have opened on parks while you've seen closures on the high street and you've seen closures in uh, the shopping centers. So, uh, we are also the UK's largest owner and operator of parks that scale allows us to do portfolio deals. Meaning when Marks and Spencers comes to us and wants to expand in a park, they may want to uh, enter a new park that they don't have a location in. They want to expand their food offering or their food hall um, and therefore need more space uh, at an existing location. They may want to re-gear a lease. We can have all of those conversations together because we've got the physical reach uh, across the UK. So that's the second strand of our business. The third then is London last mile. Um, and here we really, really like the fundamentals. And just to be clear, when we talk London logistics, we're not talking big box up the M1. We're very much focused on um, London. And the reason we like it is um, e-commerce is driving um, the entire logistics market. 
but in London, there's additional tailwinds. And those tailwinds are rising expectations about speed and convenience of delivery. There's more stringent requirements from London councils on uh, low carbon, low pollution deliveries. Get the trucks off the road, get the carbon off the road and, and focus on more electric deliveries. And our product provides that opportunity to occupiers. And also operators can make substantial savings by being closer to the customer. So 60% of the cost base of a logistics provider is in transport costs. If we're able to, whereas rent is only 6% of their cost base. So if we're able to provide them with really compelling space, much closer to where their end customer is in central London, then um, uh, it's an efficient uh, format from them as well. So really, really strong demand. You couple that with the fact that there's vacancy rates are very, very low in central London. They're 0.4%. So that demand dramatically exceeds supply. Um, as a result here, rents have grown much more strongly than the wider logistic market. We expect them to continue to do so, and hence why we think this is a really exciting part and the third strand of, of our business. Let me now touch a little bit on developments. So a key driver of value creation for British land historically has been developments. And it's something we continue to um, look at as, as we look, look, look forward. So in our, in our innovation and life sciences part, pipeline, I mentioned earlier, we committed to the Peterhouse expansion in Cambridge. As I said, there's very little supply of innovation uh, space here. Uh, and we're having good, um, good conversations on prelets uh, and that will de deliver us a good return of around 12, 12%. At Canada Water, we're progressing well with phase one. So Canada Water, as I, as I said earlier, is on the Rotherhithe Peninsula. We've got um, 53 acres of blank canvas really to develop a new town center within London. Uh, phase one includes some offices, uh, some residential plots, and those will deliver in Q4 2024. Part of the planning that we got also meant that we needed and, and, and required to build some affordable housing, uh, and that will complete later this year, and we pre-sold that to the London Borough of Southwark. So those are uh, two uh, of our committed um, uh, developments that we're progressing with. As we look forward, uh, there's optionality across our portfolio. We're looking at uh, to Finsbury Avenue. Uh, so this is not something we've committed to yet but we are progressing with enabling works, meaning buying optionality and, and getting the foundations ready for when we do commit. Um, we need a prelet here, given the scale. This is a 750,000 square foot um, office on our Broadgate campus. We think it'd be one of the best buildings um, in London. Uh, we're having very good prelet conversations um, uh, and we would need that to commit to uh, the scheme, but you know, really encouraging conversations at very good rents. Uh, and we expect that this building will deliver um, returns in line with our um, hurdle rates. And then lastly, um, in urban logistics, um, we uh, acquired sites over the last 18 months. We've gotten planning. So we've got planning uh, at Mandela Way, the image on the left here, but also the box in Paddington, which is space under one of our buildings at the Paddington campus was originally space for storage of facilities for Crossrail. We then were looking at it as an affordable workspace, but actually from a logistic perspective, it's a great location because of, of, of where it's located and, and the transport links into West London. Uh, and we got planning on that earlier this year. Uh, the council actually loved the space and said, this is exactly the type of thing that we want in inner London. It allows us to get trucks off the road. It allows for low post pollution delivery. Um, so we got planning on that uh, this year. Both of these will be amongst the best, most sustainable last mile logistics facilities in London. Um, and it, actually a new generation of product that doesn't exist today of multi-story warehouses. Um, these will deliver really good returns as well in the mid-teens. Um, so really excited to sort of progress uh, and develop on these. Haven't yet committed to them, uh, but we anticipate doing so in the second half of this year. Overall, we think development profit. So what's the capital appreciation in the business from developing our entire pipeline, which we'll do over the course of many years, we think is up to 1.4 billion pounds. Um, so a key lever for us uh, to create value going forward.
So that paints a bit a picture on um, the three parts of our market. Um, as I said, we we feel and, and can demonstrate through our delivery in the first six months and, and prior years, uh, we are operating the best part, parts of each of those markets where there's really strong demand for that product. Um, and that is translated into our financial performance. So in the first six months of this year, we delivered 142 million of underlying profit. That's 3.4% growth. That was driven by 2% like for like net rental growth. And we kept a very tight grip on our costs. Earnings per share were up 3.4% to 15.2 pence. And we'll pay an interim dividend of 12.16 pence. That's up 4.8%. Net tangible assets um, were down 3.9%. That's a function of the 2.5% decrease in the value of the portfolio I talked about earlier um, as yields moved out. But that was mitigated by strong rental growth. LTV, a proxy for leverage, so the value or quantum of debt relative to the value, the value of our assets, that increased marginally to 36.9%. Um, that was impacted by the value decline, but is cushioned by disposal. So we sold a, a, a non-core office and data center portfolio earlier this year at 13% ahead of book value. We also received the surrender payment from Meta uh, to surrender their space at One Triton Square. It was a proactive decision for us to take the space back so we can then repurpose it as an innovation life science space. So we got a very good uh, payment for that, seven years of rent uh, cash up front. So we we're really pleased to have landed that. That helped uh, with our LTV. And then group net debt to EBITDA is another leverage metric we look at, and that improved. Uh, it came down to six times um, for the six months to the end of September. In real estate, having a strong financial position and balance sheet is um, really important, and I'm really pleased our balance sheet's in a very good shape. We have excellent liquidity. We At September 30th, we have 1.7 billion pounds of undrawn facilities in cash. Uh, and based on our current commitments and debt facilities, we don't need to refinance until mid-2026. Um, we have good access to debt markets. Um, we uh, were reaffirmed by Fitch. In August, again this year, uh, our, they affirmed all of our credit ratings, including our senior unsecured at A with a stable outlook. We're the only European REIT to be given an A unsecured rating by Fitch, so really pleased with that. Um, and the markets are open. We did 600 million of financing activity this year. Uh, at the British land level, we extended 250 million pounds of bank revolving credit facilities. And then after September 30th, the post period and we continued to be active and we raised four new term loans totaling 350 million pounds. So all five year loans with four different banks. Uh, so, you know, funding to 2028. And we're really pleased to have done this because it's um, unsecured and flexible debt. It supports our strategy. We're going to be active in recycling and redeploying. Um, this debt has the same financial covenants as all our other unsecured finance, so no interest cover covenants. Um, and at September, um, we've got material headroom to our covenants. We could withstand a further 45% decline in values before we come close to breaching any of those. As I said, net debt to EBITDA improved in the period, um, and now LTV moved marginally up. But your know, balance sheet's in a really strong position. And then lastly, I thought it'd be useful to just talk about how we think about capital allocation. Um, firstly, the resilience of our balance sheet that I talked about is of utmost importance. It gives us the flexibility to invest in opportunities as, as they arise. And we strengthened it in the period through the disposals that I talked about, through the surrender receipt we received at One Triton Square. But we do look uh, and remain selective and disciplined in deploying capital into future acquisitions. So over the half, we acquired a retail park, the Thanet Retail Park, uh, which is just over 50 million pound um, uh, uh, purchase and an 8.1% net initial yield, uh, which we thought was a very good income return. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to seek investment opportunities to provide a good return for us. Um, as I touched on, we have a very attractive development pipeline. Um, when all our committed developments come on stream, when they finish, they will deliver another 71 million pounds of rent over and above the rent we get today. Uh, and we committed in the period to the Peterhouse expansion that I talked about earlier. And then lastly, we remain committed to shareholder distributions. 
uh, and we've grown the dividend 4.8% in the period, reflective of the strong uh, operating performance uh, of our business. So to wrap up, you know, really strong occupational momentum of the last 18 months has continued unabated. Um, and it really is testament to the capability of our teams, but also the quality of our portfolio. We are really seeing bifurcation and it's evident uh, in our performance and we're benefiting it from in all parts of our submarket, whether it's campuses, retail parks, or uh, London Urban Logistics. And being in the right submarkets means uh, it's being translated into accelerating rental growth. So that rental growth combined with the portfolio yield I talked about earlier around 6%, plus the uh, development upside I talked about provides really an attractive return profile going forward in our business. So I'll wrap it up there. I hope that provides a good summary of sort of uh, the headlines of our, our um, uh, six months performance. I'm very happy to take uh, any questions. Perfect, Pavesh. Thank you very much indeed for your presentation this morning. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab that's situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the team take a few moments to review those questions that were submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Um, Sean, Pavesh, as you can see there in the Q&A tab, we have received a number of questions uh, throughout your presentation this morning. And thank you to all of those on the call for taking the time to submit their questions but Sean if I may just hand back to you just to chair uh, the Q&A session if I could just ask you to read out those questions and give your responses uh, where appropriate to do so and then I'll pick up from you at the end thank you perfect thank you Jake um, so Pavesh uh, we've got a few questions here um, if I start with the first one uh, the question is with high occupancy rates and strong leasing performance what trends are you observing in the tenant demand and how do you plan to capitalize, capitalize on these trends moving forward so as, 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 as I mentioned when we talk to occupiers on the ground what are they saying to us firstly most organizations all organizations I'm sure many of you will have done this are asking their staff what do you want out of the workplace right post pandemic how do we get you back into the office? We want you back in for collaboration, to work together, but what is it that you want? And the things they're demanding are the things that we provide on our campuses, whether it's uh, first and foremost location, right? Um, if you're gonna get your staff to get on the tube, on the train and come into London, the, the, the place of work needs to be above a really good transport node. And for us, that's Liverpool Street, it's Paddington, it's uh, Houston, uh, Houston uh, Square across our campuses. So location is really important. Uh, but also all the other, um, what I like to call is the blank canvas, right? We've got large floor plates. So occupiers don't want to spread their staff over six floors. They want them over one floor or two floors. And we provide that across our campuses. Uh, but it's all of the other sort of non-negotiables around that, whether it's shower facilities, whether it's bike racks, whether it's um, good places for lunch, the public realm. So an example there is we invested in Exchange Square at Broadgate campus. Uh, we redeveloped the outdoor space. We put in some seating areas, some greenery, some water fountains, some good co co uh, coffee shops, good restaurants. That's what our tenants are asking for and demanding. That's what their staff are asking for and demanding to say, if you want me back in the office, then, you know, make it easy for me to get in location, make sure it's in an exciting part of town make sure there's amenity and good public realm around. So I'm interested in coming in. Um, and we use an example called hotelification of space that seems to have resonated when we talk to investors. You know, increasingly the office is like a hotel. You want all of the amenities, um, the end of trip facilities, the flexibility that you would get if you were to, you know, um, get, get some hotel space. The other trend that is really important, I didn't really talk about it, but it's critical is sustainability. So occupiers, when making decisions on where they want um, their space, sustainability is important. And the reason is if you're an accounting firm, a law firm, uh, a brokerage, um, many of them have set net zero targets, as, as many of your businesses will, will have. And the choices they have when they actually think about well, how to actually deliver those targets, one of the biggest choices is, is their selection of office space. And so when occupiers come talk to us, they, they want to know the sustainability credentials. We have a metric in real estate called BREAM. And all of our developments are BREAM outstanding or excellent. And that enables an occupier to help deliver their um, sustainability targets. So 
that's an important criteria as well. And as I talked about, each of our campuses is focused on, we think, that part of the market that is where the demand is because of location, sustainability, the experience we provide. Um, and that's why that, that's how we capitalize on that, that those trends in demand. Evidence in our leasing performance. Brilliant. Thank you, Vivesh. So um, actually, a good, good question to follow up from that. You're touching on how sustainability is an important um, uh, feature for our, for our occupiers. So, so a question here, it says, how are your sustainability efforts translated into financial benefits? And what are the plans for enhancing sustainability across the portfolio? It's core to what we do. It's not a, um, it's not a nice to do. It's a commercially sensible thing to do. Um, and why is it commercially sensible? The example I gave you earlier, right? Let me, let me give you a concrete example on one building on one occupier. So Allen and Overy, uh, a law firm uh, many of you may recognize, took space on our Broadgate development. They took it um, last early last year, so in 2022. The building does not complete until 2025. And the reason they took it was, and they didn't move very far, Right. They had they were on Bishop's Gate. They had 700,000 square feet of space. They'd sublet 300 of it. So that trend I talked about, about people wanting less space, they had already sublet some of that down. Uh, so they were using about 400,000 square feet and they came onto our one Broadgate development and took 350,000 square feet. Uh, and the reason they took it was because they could reduce their operational carbon by 80 percent. And that was a key lever for them to say, this is a much more efficient building we're moving into. And how does it translate into financial benefits? One, we we're able to pre-let that building well before it was completed. Two, at really good rents. Um, uh, so the speed at which we're, we're, we're um, leasing it um, and the rate that we're getting, the price that we're getting is really down to, the reason they chose this was because of the sustainability element of that building. So it's good business for us. We don't do it because we like to do it, although that's important, but it is also because that's what our occupiers are demanding. And uh, you heard me talk about this BRIA metric. Uh, so I guess it's an industry metric that measures the sustainability credentials of a building, both in terms of embodied. So what is the carbon in building something, the concrete, the steel, the transportation of materials to construct, but also then in the operational elements, the running of it. And every development that we focus on has to be BRIAM outstanding, uh, because that's what our occupiers want, and that's what we that's what we um, that's what we deliver. Brilliant, uh, thank you. Uh, I've got one more question here, um, and you've kind of touched on it, for, especially for the campuses. But uh, it says, please, can you uh, comment on how you view your competitive position within the market? So there's lots of chatter on offices and what, what's happening to vacancy rates, et cetera. And, you know, um, I, I bring you back to the Broadgate example, right? Vacancy rates have risen, right? Vacancy rates in the city are 11 and percent. So, um, but when you talk about the office market in London, it, it's quite, quite material, right? It's, we are a small proportion of that. And our product is the quality end of the spectrum. Um, all the things I talked about around um, the benefits that a campus provides. Uh, and so we feel that bifurcation that we're seeing is because we're in the right markets. We're seeing really good leasing, leasing above market rents. Our campuses are full. Our occupancy rates are in the high 90s or as high as 100% of Paddington. So we feel we're providing um, a product where there's very little of it. Um, you know, that stat I talked about, 70% of all take up was new space. Is what occupiers are demanding. And we're actually benefiting. There's a lot of narrative around Canary Wharf and what's happening there. And that is challenging in that space, but we're benefiting the city because occupiers like HSBC, like Clifford Chance, like Credit Suisse, uh, they're, they're moving back into the city and wanting some of the high quality space that we offer. Um, so we think we have a real sort of advantage in providing sort of the best high quality space in, in campuses. Uh, and it's not just the building, right? It's it's everything that comes around the campus, um, the public realm, the amenity, um, the, the the non-negotiables, right? The little things like you, you know, uh, at our Broadgate, uh, the Allen and Overy building I talked about. One of the things we developed, we built into the basement was a thousand bike racks because we know our occupiers and our staff 
other occupiers want to cycle into work and all the showering facilities. Um, and so making it as, you know, that hotelification that I talked about earlier. Uh, in retail parks, um, we are the largest owner and operator of parks. Um, that gives us our advantage, right? We're able to do portfolio deals uh, and we understand our customers. Uh, you know, the MS example I gave you, I could repeat that for BM. You know, they just took some space with us at Teesside uh, and they're desperate to grow in the north of England and cannot find space. And they're a good tenant with us at other spaces. We're able to work with them to provide them that space to help them, uh, you know, as I said earlier, it's a simple steel box, easy to adapt to meet what they needed. Um, uh, and we, that's the place that we want to continue to grow in. And then in London last mile, there is no space, right? There's very little, um, you know, Seagrow and a few others are looking to get into that space, but vacancy rates of 0.4%. Uh, it's a new uh, market. Uh, rents are at a level now where the economic stack, where perhaps they wouldn't have a couple of years ago. Um, and our advantage there is we know London really well. We know how to navigate planning, politics. We know how to develop. We know how to work with some of the big construction firms in London. Um, and so all of those skills that le led us to build the cheese grater building or uh, all the buildings you see across all of our campuses, whether it's Hunter Liverpool Street or the Broadgate development that we're doing, we're able to redeploy those skills to also find um, uh, space in London to redevelop, whether it's space under our campus at Paddington, the box I talked about earlier, we bought a car park in Finsbury Square, so the Finsbury Square car park, which we'll redevelop um, with the Mandela Way site that I talked about. These are all really, you know, well-located central London sites that need somebody to navigate planning. And we, you know, there's a Mandela Way, for example, we've got a great relationship with Southwark through Canada Water. We are also able to, through, through that relationship, uh, persuade them to give us planning on uh, logistics and Mandela Way. And the same development team that builds the office buildings will build uh, these develop these logistics facilities. So I think that that strength and you know it's many many decades of development in London that that is the skill within this business that we that we can set us apart. Brilliant, thank you, Ravesh. Um, that's it at the moment for the questions from what I can see. So Jake, I will hand back over to you. Perfect. Sean Bavesh, thank you very much indeed for addressing all of those uh, questions that came in from investors today. Um, and of course, if there are any further questions that do come through, we'll make these available to you immediately after the presentation has ended, uh, just for you to review to then add any additional responses, of course, where it's appropriate to do so. And we'll publish all those responses out on the platform. Um, but Bavesh, perhaps before really just looking to redirect those on the call to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing comments just to wrap up with, that'd be great. Yeah, Wilson, thank you for taking the time to listen. I just I just wrap where I started to say really good performance in the first half of the year, good operational momentum. You know, the yield shift and, and has slowed. We're seeing really good rental growth. Um, we are in the right parts of each of our markets, right? We are seeing bifurcation in campuses. Retail parks is the best and preferred format for retailers. And the fundamentals in London last mile logistics are super strong. So um, you know, 90% of our portfolio is in those chosen sub-markets. We've reshaped our portfolio and we're really driving the operational performance uh, of the business and look forward with confidence uh, to deliver really strong returns for our investors. Bavesh, that's great. And thank you once again for updating investors uh, today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can really better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of British Land Company PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good afternoon to you all. Thank you.